Welcome and good morning. Um, I'm thankful that we're all able to make it here this morning and just to hear and join us in this worship service where we get to praise our God and hear His Word preached to us. Um, with that, I know we're all coming from different places, different um, cities, areas, and really just different places in our lives. But one thing that we kind of all have in common is that we live in this world, a world that we all see is broken. I mean, just turn on the news for 10 minutes and you can see just how chaotic and how messed up this world is. I know this world's not in a good place. And that knowledge, it causes me to long for a day when all of this chaos, all this hurt, all this damage will be no more. Do you long for a day like this when all wrongs will be made right? When children can live whole lives without the cruelties of this world and the systems that we have in place? When all people will be treated equally and fair. Well, if that is you, then you have pretty much the same longings that every single Christian throughout all of time has ever had. A longing that is good, that you should long for. Longing for this hope. This hope that I do believe will exist one day when the King, Jesus, returns. However, what happens when in this broken world, even the longing for a better time is abused? When those who want something better are taken advantage of? Well, we see this exact situation play out in the passage we're going to be looking at today. And we can see that those who long for the world to be made right, we're going to see what they are called to do, even in this broken world. So turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 10. We're going to be reading this together in full. It begins in verse 1. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I know as we read this passage, it sounds kind of crazy because it kind of is. But based off this passage, this is what Paul is getting at. This is what I want you to take from the reading of this passage. Love the truth so you won't be deceived. Love the truth so you won't be deceived. And when we come to this passage, there's this heavy kind of warning idea here. There's 
a warning that Paul is given, a command really for these people. And this command is actually doubling up, I think, as kind of a warning and a plea. And I think that because of what comes before. You see, the Thessalonian church, they're a pretty interesting church. In fact, this Thessalonian church may be one of the best churches we have in the Bible because Paul has nothing but encouragement for them. Nothing but encouragement and great encouragement at that. He says to them, your faith is growing abundantly. Look, your love is increasing. If you've been a part of the church for long, those are the two things that every church wants. It's for their faith to grow abundantly and their love for one another to increase. That and Paul. Paul, who is one of the greatest Christians to ever a Christian of all time, this one is telling this church, you're doing great. You're doing well. And I think one of the reasons why he's so encouraging is because as you move along, we see that they're facing heavy persecutions. They're struggling really, really hard. The things that they're going through are not easy. And because they're facing such hard tribulations in the moment, it makes sense that they would set their hope, not in this world, but in a world to come. The hope that Jesus Christ will return. And this hope, this is a great hope. This is the hope for every one of us who are believers, that Jesus will return and all things will be made right. And the people who long for this the most are the ones who feel the most pain in this world and the injustices, just like the church of Thessalonica, the Thessalonica. Because the pain we see causes us to see how messed up this world is. This is the truth of it. And it makes us long to see the day when Jesus returns. Of course, the Thessalonians are looking forward to this. Of course, this is their desire, their, their joy, their hope that this isn't the end. There's something more. But we see in verses 1 through 3 that Paul is giving them a plea, a warning. Because enemies are trying to take advantage of them. Paul wants them, he tells them, don't be deceived about the return of Christ. Don't be shaken. Don't be alarmed when people tell you that it is happening, that it's about to go down. Because it's not happening yet. Paul is desperately getting them to Yes, hope in the return of Christ, but not to see that the return is right now. There's a danger to that. Yes, there's a lot of terribleness. Yes, their desires are right. But these people, they're leading them away from the truth. And that's why Paul is so desperate. He's pleading, he pleads twice here for them to not be persuaded by these people because he loves them dearly and he wants them to not be deceived at all. Seems pretty intense. Pretty, pretty like he's pushing so hard. He's wanting this so badly. But why? Why is he trying to get them to not do these things? Why is he so desperate in this attempt? Well, I think it's because of what verses 3 through 8 tell us. And that is, they already know the truth about the end. 
They already know what's supposed to happen. So then they shouldn't be deceived. And what it is that they know is they know the truth of the lawless one and that he must come before the end can happen. Now, verses 3, it, it tells us about this rebellion and the man of lawlessness. And, I mean, this guy's a real piece of work. <laughs> He's a really bad dude. He's not like Disney villain bad, where you can kind of sometimes feel sorry for them. But he's evil, oppressive, murderous dictator bad. The worst of the worst kind of person you could think of, he's worse than that. I mean, his name is Lawlessness, after all. And he has two names, and the other one's not better. It's the Son of Destruction. I mean, this guy doesn't sound like one you want to mess with. This guy sounds like a really, really bad dude. Not just because of his names either, but because of what this passage tells us he does right in the next verse. This guy is so bad that he is just defying all religions, all gods. Not because he hates religion. Not because he doesn't want religion. But he wants everybody to not worship them, but him. You see, it says that he's going to sit on the very throne of God and say, I am God. This guy's messed up. This guy is prideful. He doesn't care who he steps on. He only cares about himself. And when we're talking about this man of lawlessness, I'm sure a lot of questions come to your mind. Like, who on earth is this guy? Is, when is he coming? Has he already come? I mean, I know when we're talking about this guy, you guys had a few people immediately jump into your mind of like, ah, that's the man of lawlessness. Oh wait, maybe it's this guy. And to be honest, I had some people jump into my mind as well. I mean, We've seen a lot of people in this world who are similar to this. Do I think this man of lawlessness has come yet? Probably not, just because as we'll see, when he comes, so will Jesus. But I don't think that that doesn't mean there are going to be more people like him who come, or there weren't people who represent him in a small way who came before. See, I think there have been many who are like him who've come, and I think there will be many who will be like him come again. This guy will come, and I think he has in a way. But how will we know then, if there's so many people who could be in, how will we know when it's truly him? Well, Paul here says, you, he tells them, like, don't you remember what I told you before? And I know that's very, very helpful for us because we totally know what he's talking about here. But either way, Paul seems convinced that this church will know. And I think that also gives us a great comfort to know or to believe that when this one truly does come, we will know as well. And whether it's here or not, it doesn't change our response. We have to hold on to the truth. We have to love the truth and see the truth. There is one who will come. Therefore, we know that right now is not the time. Don't be deceived. Don't fall into the trap that the enemy wants you to fall in. This one must still come. And he's coming. At the moment, he's restrained, it says. But it also says that this lawlessness is still mysteriously working. Even though he's restrained, 
it's still mysteriously working. And I don't think I have to convince you much of this. We've talked about how we all see that the world is just kind of broken and there's a whole bunch of chaos going around. The world is messed up. He's not even revealed yet. And how much more will it be when he is revealed? It's got to be bad. But interestingly, we don't have to worry too much. Because as soon as he's revealed, in verse 8, it says, The Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Jesus will crush this one. Praise God for it. And he crushes him in an interesting way. By the breath of his mouth, he will come to nothing. Just as the breath of God brought life into existence, at the end, the same breath will remove the greatest of enemies from existence. He will be no more. He will come to nothing. Jesus is appearing means the end of this lawless one and our unification with him. It is no wonder then why when Jesus' return is going to be our greatest hope. When he does, all evil will be crushed. But that, so this world is not yet at that point. We still feel the power of this lawlessness. And it comes from Satan himself and those who are perishing, perishing or those who are against God. These are the powers that are at work in the world. And because of all of them, we face trials. We face some hard stuff. Because these ones are working against Jesus and his kingdom. And their actions will bring about, eventually, this coming of the lawless one. I don't know when, but I do know he's coming. This is the truth that we must be holding on to. That he will come, but Jesus will destroy him. His coming, when he does come, is not outside of the power of Jesus. Jesus has power over all things, and he will defeat this lawless one. So although he's going to come and it's going to be bad, although he will have great power, he will cause much strife, and chaos will abound, the people of God ultimately have nothing to fear as long as they remain faithful to the truth, as long as they love the truth and hold on to it. That is why Paul wants the people to be so um, alert, wants them to be warned. Don't be fooled, he says. Christ will come. But he hasn't yet. See, the lawless one must be revealed. And then after the lawless one revealed, then there will come judgment. Judgment on not only this lawless one, but on all those who are against God. And that's what we see in verses 9 through 12, the judgment that is coming on all those against him. See, this judgment is for Satan. This judgment is for the lawless one. This judgment is, on, is for all of those who side with him. And judgment for all of those who are deceived by him as well. It may seem really, really harsh. Like, man, why do people who are deceived, why are these the ones who are getting punished? Ultimately, there's somebody behind the scenes working. Well, this passage explains that this judgment is just and earned for all those who will be judged. You see, even those who are deceived, they're still making the choice. 
They are still choosing to side with the wicked powers of the world, not with God, but with what they want, which is unrighteousness. They refuse to love the truth, and they refuse to be saved, it says. And because of that, they get the same judgment. A very real and eternal judgment will fall on all all of those who follow him and turn from God. It makes sense then why Paul is so adamant about pleading, don't be deceived. Because if you are, you will be among those who are judged. If you fall away, you will be turning away from God and to the enemy. So don't be deceived. Hold on to truth and love it. Just as these ones who are perishing refuse to love the truth and be saved, we must love that truth so that we will make it to the end. That end will be a crazy, yet glorious day. It says that God will send a strong delusion. And I really just see this as God's final separation of the people, those who are with him and those who are against him. Those who believe the delusion, those in the church and those outside of the church, will be officially seen as the sheep or the goats. This judgment goes deep. God, like, you might have come here thinking, man, I think I'm all right. I'm doing what I need to do. I come to church every once in a while. Like, this is what God wants from me, right? I mean, in some sense, yeah. But he doesn't just want some of you. He wants you and all of it. He wants you to love the truth that Jesus is coming back. He wants you to see that that is the most important thing. And he wants you to hold on to this truth and love it, which means love the righteousness. Take pleasure in righteousness, not unrighteousness. Because if you don't, then you're going to follow the delusion. And you're going to end up among these people. See, there will be no doubts as to who follows God and who follows Satan. Who follows this man of lawlessness. There will be no doubt. At all. God knows your heart. You can't fool him. And that is why it is so important for you to hold on to the truth, to love the truth, which means to take pleasure in righteousness, not unrighteousness. Because, I mean, when Jesus does come return, we will be made perfect. We will be made fully righteous. So why wouldn't we start living that way now? I mean, he died so that we would become righteous. And he was risen so that we might have new life. And is that, that is the guarantee that we know this truth that Jesus is coming again. It might not be right now. It might be super far into the future, but he will come. So don't listen to all those crazy people who are saying, Jesus is here. The world is ending. Because even if they get it right, you're still called to hold on to the truth. Take pleasure in righteousness. Let's pray. 
while I'm actually praying. Lord, I am thankful for this opportunity to just try a really interesting passage, and I'm thankful for the encouragement it has been to me. Um, I pray that this will be just a good opportunity to grow in my preaching um, and good critique session. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I guess, as I was telling you earlier, um, it was just even coming to this crazy text to understand, there was things that I saw that I was like, oh yeah, that's good. And then like even going to some commentaries, like saying like, those are things they saw or they didn't understand either. And it's just like, I have some tools to come to these now <laughs> and get on the right track. So that's good. Yeah, I'm just, I think just, you know, in our passage, just talking about the man of lawlessness and in the midst of it, just bringing up, and you know, Christ is coming too, along with them, and mm. just that thought again of just, I can't wait till he comes back. encouraged that even the rise of uh, deception and the lawless one or lawlessness in general for the Christian who is in the know and is holding on to the truth it should only serve to strengthen our hope in Christ's return mm. so it's like this, this I don't know something about like the way you put it which was as these things progress so should our hope like five written down, but we'll choose one. Um, so I think this kind of screwed me up a little bit with my structure. I was thinking about doing inductively and never really made the decision till last minute and then <laughs> kind of helped, that kind of ruined how I was moving through the text, what, whether I was explaining things early or later. And so I just think that I needed to make that decision earlier, and I really do think that I would try to preach this one inductively, kind of come to my main point at the end, This because I see that opposite of what the perishing are doing at the end. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, so you, you did do it inductively? No, I mean, kind of, no, I put my main point in the beginning. Okay, so. and then you only preached that main, did you have other points in it? Kind of, it was more of the movement of the passage, it was... If I were to say them more simply, it was along the lines of the warning, um, the uh, three through eight, which is the man of lawlessness, and then the end, which is uh, the judgment. Okay, okay. I just, I was able to follow along with you, but it's just like there was that lack of like mm -hmm. distinguishing. So, yeah. But because you, you're matching up your verses, I was able to... Um, I, I had a little bit of a hard time. Uh, I think I understood your argument, mm -hmm. but, but like, um, there were like a couple applications you made that I, like I was asking myself, um, like like at the beginning, and you kind of like answered some of them at the end. But yeah. Like in in the midst of it, I was asking that like why. Is it so bad to be deceived? Mm -hmm. um, and like, like you, 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 like you had a really strong way, like you need to love the truth. Mm -hmm. 
and and so I wrote down like how do I do that? Mm-hmm. Um, and you 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 did put in some like ethical stuff at the end, but I I didn't feel like I cleaned your, mm-hmm. I cleaned your application at the end and some of the questions I was having in my mind. Yeah, yeah. I definitely didn't explain that deceived mm-hmm. aspect much. What is lawlessness? Why is that mm. a problem? Um, there's another one. Oh, well, like even getting to like the truth, like what is what mm-hmm. is the truth? right? Um, you did it, you did it here and there, but it used to be more present than here. So gotcha. Yeah. So if I'm an unbeliever, I was kind of intrigued by what you were going to say, but as soon as you got into your sermon, it was like and goodbye. So some of the definition stuff. Yeah. It, it was just like I was kind of left in the dust. Yeah. Um, and it's such a weird passage that it's like, it, it, that's why explaining things like lawlessness and stuff like that is even more important. So I'm just kind of going like, wait, what? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering. I think I'm saying the same thing as these guys, but like I understood. Like being deceived is bad here. Like uh-huh. you're gonna go away with the lawless one, and so the admonition of you of, or exhortation to love the truth, hold on to the truth. Like if I was like a new believer or a believer has been kind of like, okay, what what, what truth am I holding on? What what yeah. is the truth? And then you're kind of tying it with uh, taking pleasure in righteousness, and I just felt like oh. I can see how somebody could easily get kind of confused if, like, okay, what is exactly the truth that I need to be holding on to? And, and the whole, what is it, the thing in the pulpit, fog in the pews, the truth, I just, it was so hard to come up with, like, a positive side to it, which I don't know if I needed to, but it, it confused me, so I was probably ah. not clear totally. I was definitely not clear in my own mind, so obviously very not clear up here. Um, I think uh, I think it's like really easy to listen to and, and you have a good tone. I think a couple times like uh, you 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 sound like you're gonna end, mm. right? And you don't end, mm-hmm. and so just like it's just a little thing to just like watch that. Um, you mean in the sentence or in the sermon? In, like in the sermon. Like, I yeah. Gotcha. Like, so like, the you're, you're landing. Right. And like you weren't concluding, you have like additional things to say. Right. So just watch that. Gotcha. Um, you okay? I'll take one. <laughs> uh, Want me to give you one? Well, there was something I wanted to mention in relation to. Um, like the love of the truth and and salvation. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't remember how I was thinking about it in my mind, but like something like the relationship between like the the, the love of deception and the love of righteousness, and I just don't remember how I was gonna word it. Mm. There was something else, but, um. <laughs> so uh, you I don't know. If, at first, I thought you screwed up, but then you talked about it like this again. Hope is not what we have at the end. Yeah, yeah. But you kept talking about, like, and this is when we will have hope. I was like, no, <laughs> that's when we won't need to have any hope. Yeah. So it was just very confusing. At first, I was confused. Then I was like, wait, what are you talking about? Yeah, I didn't like my intro. So I even told Theo, should I just dump my intro and then just go into it? And so I didn't like edit it at all. And so, but yeah, I totally see that. Uh, What did you feel like you made some progress on? Hmm. Um, Last sermon. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I moved through it well. Um, And one, one thing that I've gotten a lot is like, I was tracking with you, but I really didn't feel like it was a part of the text. So I think one thing I did do is point you guys back to the text enough. And so, yeah, that was 
something that I wanted to do. Yeah, you definitely did a good job at that. I feel like every time I've listened to you, you keep getting stronger in your presentation. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like just yourself, your voice, how you're just, the fluctuation, just like it just keeps getting better and better. So. Appreciate that. Um, for like a confusing passage, I think you did a good job not letting like easy, easy applications go. Like you, you picked up on um, uh, the, the, the piece at the end about like we should start living righteous now. Mm. It's a clear thing in the text that like, we should see. Um, and, and different, different like you just had like a couple of obvious applications that came out of the text that like even though some things were confusing to you, like the stuff that was clear, mm. you really hammered down mm. very well. Hmm. Yeah, I think your use of questions throughout is really great. And I think you grow in that aspect of just considering what your audience might be thinking and asking the questions to help you move along. Mm. I thought that was, that was well done. Yeah, so I thought that it was really the way you pulled it off, where you're like, man, this man of lawlessness, he's a piece of work. <laughs> and just kind of be like, no, he's really bad. So you kind of really was, you made it so it was like, ooh, oh, yeah, oh, man, yeah, this text, not just like you, but like you kept pointing it back, hopefully, he's real bad. And you're like, okay, so who is he? Mm. And like, has he already come, or is this the future, or whatever? And you were just like, we all want to know that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, but there's plenty like it who have come. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, so he, it was it was not like a political, like, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> it was like a, I don't think, it sure seems like there's a lot of people like this. Mm -hmm. But he's really bad. But when he gets comes, Jesus comes, Jesus ends him. So I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. So definitely captured attention and paid off and went by re-emphasizing what the main point, the frustrating point of the passage mm -hmm. Even though I missed your points in there, which you didn't really quite have, you were saying, yeah. I was able to, to follow you from intro into your context work, into where you were getting into the text, and then your mapping, your pointing us back to the verses. I, I could follow you mm -hmm. all the way through that. Even I, I like the way you did your context work. Was this a little bit longer in terms of doing context work for you? Well, it was nice because this is only a three-chapter book, so I was able to read it a bit and understand okay. the relationship Paul has with these people better. And so it was a little bit longer than I think I normally yeah. would do, and I meant to go even afterwards and show, like, look, even they're called to be standing firm right after this which is what I was trying to say, but trying not to say as well. So, yeah, thanks. solid reminder of Christ's return being a real thing and the more you see like stuff going on in the world like the more reason you have to open these things mm -hmm. uh, I thought you just argued really well to your main point like you just you kept coming back to it and it, was, and it was very much like a recentering thing where it's like, everything's crazy. Just do this thing. Love the truth. Uh, what about it? Oh, just love the truth. What if he's already come? Just love the truth. What if he hasn't even come yet? Love the truth. 
Mm -hmm. So it, it was just, it didn't feel like super repetitive, mm -hmm. but it did feel like you were just rolling back to that super helpful way of being like, this one thing we do. Mm -hmm. Solid. Uh, thank you guys. Here we go.